In this video, I want to talk about the questions on the exam that were related to muscle, physiological, cross-sectional area, and strength. Now, there's only three questions in this category that were, were commonly missed, but before I jump into them, I just want to give you a refresher about how we count well, what what physiological cross-sectional area is and why it's a useful thing to know so physiological cross-sectional area or pcsa for short because it's a long thing to write out is the cross-section of a muscle when it's measured perpendicular to its muscle fibers so we saw if you have a pennate muscle with maybe i'll uh, draw a tendon like this and then you have muscle fibers coming off like this maybe another tendon up here. We saw the physiological cross-sectional area is the cross-sectional slice of the muscle like this. So it's essentially like how much muscle fibers do you have arranged in parallel that can produce force. And it's different if you have a pennate muscle. It's different than just what's the anatomical cross-sectional area that you could measure with just like a, an MRI or, or, a, or something. Um, although, if you know the pination angle, you can just correct for that when you calculate physiological cross-sectional area. And PCSA is useful to know because if you just take that amount and you multiply it by the special number that we usually call um, sigma, it's the specific tension of muscle, and we usually just assume it's a constant of about 60 newtons per centimeter squared. The interpretation of that number but is per crop per per square centimeter of cross-sectional area, how much uh, force can a muscle produce? So if you have a muscle that has a cross-sectional area, a physiological cross-sectional area of one square centimeter, we would expect it can produce 60 newtons of force. Those are useful things to, this PCSA is useful to know because if you multiply it by 60, if you multiply it by this specific tension muscle, you get the max, you get the, the, uh, maximum isometric force production capabilities. So that tells you what is the absolute amount of force you can produce when you are right here on the force uh, length curve. And again, this I made a canvas announcement about this last week uh, because I realized that this this incredibly useful formula was not actually in the notes initially, and they are updated now. Although I will take that the fact that you didn't know this explicitly uh, in the notes at least. I think I did talk about it in the videos, but it wasn't in the notes until a few days before the exam. So let's take a look at these questions. Uh, here, these three exam questions. Suppose you're looking at MRIs of the rectus femoris, one of the quadricep muscles from two patients, a basketball player and a gymnast. You notice that the basketball player's muscle is 25% longer. So maybe this is the basketball player's muscle and here's the gymnast's muscle. But they have the same physiological cross-sectional area and pination angle. So meaning, maybe, maybe the muscle's pinnated like this, meaning the PCSA is the same that would suggest immediately that the muscles would be just as strong because you would multiply that PCSA, the same number, by 60 to get the maximum isometric force production capability, which we could would, we could connect with how strong is the muscle in, in you know, conversationally. That's what we're talking about is how much can it produce in a, in a standardized uh, condition like optimal fiber length and uh, no uh, neither concentric nor eccentric contraction. So given that information, I'm immediately thinking they should be the same force. I'm immediately thinking this one should be the right answer. And uh, the intuition here is that it's not the muscle length that affects its force production capability. It's the number of muscle fibers that are arranged in parallel, which is exactly, which, which is conceptually the same thing as the physiological cross-sectional area. So longer muscles are not stronger. It's uh, muscles with a bigger cross-sectional area, well, fiber cross-sectional area. Generally, since pination angles are quite small in most muscles, this is roughly the same thing as the muscle itself just being thicker. So it's not long muscles that are strong, it's thick muscles that are strong. This next question, a weightlifting coach claims that because the gluteus medius has the largest PCSA, physiological cross-sectional area, of any of the hip extensor muscles, which is true, by the way, 
uh, the gluteus medius does have the biggest PCSA of all the hip extensor muscles. It must be the biggest contributor to hip extension torque during the deadlift. So this weightlifting coach is saying, no, it's not the glute max that's the most important muscle uh, at the hips in the deadlift. It's the glute medius because it's stronger, because the PCSA is bigger. So therefore, it must be stronger because you, you're just going to multiply that PCSA by 60 to get the maximum isometric force production capability. So a bigger cross-sectional area means more force. This is completely true. However, we're talking about torque here. So something is missing from this analysis. Let's go down through these options and, and see what's, what's missing. Does this argument from this weightlifting coach take into account maximum isometric force? And actually it does, because if you remember, we can just do PCSA times that, that specific tension. You can think of this as PCSA times 60. And that gives you the maximum isometric force. So it, this, this, that's not going to refute this argument because it does take that into account. Um, likewise, for this one, it does also take the specific tension into account because if I tell you the physiological cross-sectional area of the muscle, you can tell me it's optimal force production because the specific tension isn't going to change between people. It's not going to change between um, athletes. Now, does it take into account the moment arms of the muscles? Well, no, actually it doesn't. And this, um, as you'll see in problem set three, the different muscles, and in fact, even different compartments of the same muscle can have a different moment arm about a given joint, meaning they'll contribute, even if they produce the same amount of force, they'll contribute differently to the production of torque. How about this one? It doesn't take into account the changes in PCSA that happen during hip extension. Well, actually, uh, no, that to a first order approximation at least, um, PCSA is not gonna change during hip extension. So that one doesn't seem correct either. And so for this one, I would say this is the best answer. And this is indeed why the glute max uh, is a bigger contributor to torque at the hip during the deadlift. It's not because it's stronger per se, it's because it has a much bigger moment arm than the gluteus medius. Uh, that happens by the way, because the gluteus medius is a, a more, um, uh, is a deeper muscle, meaning it's closer to the joint center of the hip. So it doesn't have uh, as big of a distance from the hip joint to the muscle compared to the glute max, which is like outside, it's more superficial. So you get a bigger distance, bigger moment arm. So you get greater torque production. So last question in this category, suppose you work at a sports medicine clinic, one of your colleagues suggests that because the adductor muscles have penation angles that are very close to zero, you could use the anatomical cross-sectional area of an athlete's muscles measured on an MRI as a proxy measure for adductor muscle strength. Is this reasonable? So this gets back to one of the figures that is in the notes, which is uh, a muscle that has a very small or zero penation angle where the muscle fibers are arranged like this compared to one where the muscle fibers are arranged like this. And the, the notes point out that while the PCSA for this muscle is going to be more like this, and it's going to be very different from the anatomical cross-sectional area, which is just what you'd get like this. And what you would measure on an MRI if you just took, a, say, a, um, a transverse plane slice of a muscle. Um, for a muscle that has very uh, not penated, very you know, parallel, fusiform type muscles like this, um, the anatomical cross-sectional area is the same thing as the, uh, or very pretty much the same thing. Maybe if the, if the penation angle is like, you know, three degrees, the difference between the anatomical cross-section area and the PCSA are trivially small. Because when you're measuring this cross-sectional area, you're basically measuring how, what's the cross-sectional area of the muscle fibers like this. So this is actually a pretty reasonable thing to do. Now, um, some of you answered, uh, so this seems correct. That's not correct. This is maybe a bit of a distractor I shouldn't put in here um, because it, it maybe requires remembering from previous units that on an MRI, you can actually see muscles as distinct from body fat. So even if you had an athlete with a high body fat percentage, you'd still be able to accurately measure the cross-sectional area of their muscle. Now, maybe it's unfair for me to expect you to remember that for this exam. So this is probably one I'll, I'll have to uh, adjust in this course. So these were the questions on muscle force and PCSA that people uh, seem to struggle with. And there's one more category that I want to talk about in another video, which is the 
uh, moment arm questions.